have you planned on? The man who is in charge of coal production in Britain takes a look at our biggest single coal field. John Mills prepares to take off to see it from an unusual angle for him. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Mills, here we go, north by northeast. Helicopter Mike X-ray requests liftoff two on board for aerial survey of the northeast. Roger, Mike X-ray, you're clear for liftoff. Tide regional set at 1017. Thirty-four mines make up the Durham and Northumberland coal field. Down there are reserves of over 500 million tonnes. Just the Durham Cathedral. You know, it's wonderful countryside. It's one of the strange things that over Carboniferous, uh, where the coal measures lie, is often very, very beautiful countryside. Uh, dead ahead of us is Lapton Coke Ovens. In Durham, there's been very developed on the basis of its coking coal. And there are three uh, coking plants uh, which belong to the coal board in this part of the world. There's the famous Pine Bridge. Yeah. It's a great temptation to use the word taking coals to Newcastle. Yeah. And this is where it all started. Yeah, of this would be Ashington down there. But of course that's a very famous uh, mining part of the world. It's really quite an old mining community, a very large mining community. In addition to the amount of coal produced here, its other claim of fame is, of course, that the Charlton brothers came from this part of the world. 37,000 men work the northeast coal field. They and their families live in towns and villages never far from the North Sea shores. For here are the giant mines, the million tonners a year, which win coal from far out under the sea. Reconstruction and enlargement are continuing processes to cater for an expanding demand. Open cast coal mining plays its part too. Bethington Golf Course at one time was a great big open cast site. And uh, in addition to working coal by open cast methods, we pride ourselves that um, we are jolly good at reclaiming. In fact, we reclaim derelict land and put it back in a condition that's better, well, better than it was before. And OpenCast continues to develop fresh sites. The important thing about OpenCasting generally is that it enables us to meet sudden surges of demand for coal. Um, we can get it very cheaply. It helps to balance the cost of deep mining. But in addition to uh, uh, reclaiming the land, we also plant live, large, fully grown trees. In fact, we're probably the leading experts in Europe on this technique. And we, um, we have at any one time six million trees that we're growing at, in the plantations. So that when we've finished and we're restoring a site, we can um, plant trees and restore the countryside, sometimes uh, far better than it was before. Now we're coming up, aren't we, now towards um, Limehouse and the Alcan smelter up there, isn't it? That was uh, put down, of course, almost adjacent to Ellington, which is a combine, two mines linked together. They're working out under the sea, and they've got a combined output of about two and a half million tons of coal per year. Probably the biggest undersea complex that exists. One of the most modern mines, I'd say, one of the, probably one of the biggest undersea complexes that certainly that exists in Europe, maybe in the world. A million tons a year from the output of the two mines flows directly from computerized blending plant to the power station of the big aluminium smelter right next door. To make aluminium, you need lots of electricity. Using local coal as the energy source is the logical way to generate it. Now most of these coastal pits are million tonners and bait can not quite make a million tons, it's 900,000 tons. Again, uh, there, it's coal will be shipped that flies, as I say. Here again, working up to five miles out to sea. Now that's Westo Colliery, surely down over there. Westo, once again, it's almost like a, a theme song, another million tonner. You can see the coal preparation plant, that large red brick building down there. Million tonner, again, working four miles out to sea to spend about six and a half million in a major reconstruction scheme. 
So you've got to, actually there's two twins, we'll be coming to the next one, Wearmouth. Westo and Wearmouth so more or less go together, two big, big minds, both reconstructed, both playing their part in the economy of this country. About part of the output uh, from the northeast, between 47 and 50 percent, uh, goes to power stations. And uh, well, this is this I think is a drilling vessel now that you can see in front of you. You see, she's got a drilling rig on it, and she'll be drilling probably for coal at this present time, or has been. The drills are over the side. We've certainly been using her to um, prove coal off the Northumberland coast. I'll just fasten this around the back. A reversal of roles now. For the helicopter pilot, his first visit underground. At Dorden, where a roadway is being driven out into untapped reserves of coal. Morning. Morning, George. Morning. Morning. How deep are we actually going and how far out? We'll be going 1,500 feet below sea level and approximately two and a half miles out to sea. Uh, we're, we're pretty sophisticated. We've gone a long way since the days of the old pick and shovel. Well, this is what we call the laser guidance system for the tunneling machine. It's basically a high intensity light giving a half inch parallel beam which shines from this point here up to a target on the machine to which the driver steers. We're now going out along that road that Tim showed you on the plan. We're well out under the sea now. The journey will take about, I suppose, half an hour. The machine itself is electrically powered. The driving source is electrical, but the power to the head is hydraulic uh, via two pump motors. The means of cutting is by a rotary head with disc cutters on the head, and these operate as a glass cutter would when you're cutting glass at home. Uh, this is, of course, the, the first circular tunnel driving machine to be installed in British coal mines. There have been several other installations in civil engineering tunnels, but this is the first one in coal mining. 50 million tons of coal are waiting here to be won. The tunneling rig has been inching its way towards the coal at up to 80 yards a week. Durham and Northumberland are rich, too, in the historical relics of the industry which brought them prosperity. At Beamish Museum, two ex-miners reminisce about their past. goes on. This year has passed. We've uh, go down in the darkness, come back into daylight, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> that's a thing we'll never forget, Bob, but not to leave. Never. Those days have gone. So have the days of steam on the rails, except for the growing bands of enthusiasts who keep alive the magnificent machines of the past, in this, the 150th anniversary year of the founding of our railways. The railways were built on coal. Northumberland and Durham were built on coal. Their future, though, is still bound up with coal and with all that it means to the region. And we're coming up to Dorden now. You can tell Dorden because it's got its Kirby Tower winding. Uh, that's been subjected to a, a major reconstruction. It's a very profitable, highly productive pit. It's uh, doing well over one and a half million tons a year. It's really the biggest one on this coast. To match the size of these huge mines, capital investment in the industry will continue on a massive scale. Coal in the Northeast remains a forward-looking industry with an annual turnover of over 350 million pounds and a wages bill of nearly half that. Coal is the biggest business in the region and one which will continue to play the major part in generating Britain's economic recovery. Mm -hmm.